thanks for being here, guys. We're going to have fun talking about Sunday morning programming. Um, I know uh, everyone, or Saturday night, or Wednesday night, Thursday night, whenever you have kids, students in your room, um, there's a lot of stuff that goes into programming and um, just different things that we can do. And then we're going to talk about I, just things that you guys do that work really well for you and um, just any questions that you guys might have. Do you like the uh, the podcast thing? You guys like that? It's pretty cool, fun. Yeah. Uh, my name's Steven. If you uh, didn't see the podcast, uh, I'm from Church on the Ridge in Snoqualmie. If you've ever been to the network building, it's in the exact same building as the network. So the network is upstairs, and the church is in just about the rest of the uh, the building in there. So if you've gone through that building, you've seen the church. Um, been there for uh, three years now. Yeah, three, three and a half years on staff there as a children's pastor. And before that, I was at a place called... Um, church on the move in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So uh, Sunday morning programming, stuff that we do, is a lot, I talked about it a little bit on the, um, in the podcast. Most of anything that we do on our screens, and our screens are a big part of our morning and everything that goes on because it's a visual aid and it goes back to the, the, op, the, the old school object lesson type of feel. As they can see it, it just adds a such a different layer and a lot more just oomph to whatever it is you're doing like you can you can build things and and do different stuff but if you've got it on screens and different things it just seems to have worked really well but in on a sunday we always start with a welcome just talking about who we are why we're going to be there how long we're going to be there and what the expectations from the kids are um kids it they have this, they want to know what's going on when they don't know. It's, uh, and if they're in a new place and if it's a different environment, they get really nervous. And so you can really calm a lot of fears just by telling them or having a host or someone up there go and say who they are, what to expect. Like we'll say, hey, my name's Stephen. I'm, gonna, I'm one of the uh, student ministries pastors here at Kids on the Ridge. And um, today we're going to be talking to you guys and we're going to go through a bunch of things. But we have a great morning plan for you. We've got worship. The dance team's going to be out here in just a little bit singing some songs for you. Uh, Pastor Kevin is going to be out in just a bit. He's got a great uh, message for you about Jesus and how much he loves you. We're going to be playing some games. We've got a big answer, and we've got a, uh, a prize for you guys if you guys engage with uh, the game here at the end. Tell them that. They've got a rundown. They know what's going on. It's going to be about an hour, hour we'll, maybe a little over an hour. All of a sudden, those fears go, okay, I know when mom and dad are coming back. I know who these people are, and I have a structure to what's happening in this morning, and they really, really, really do a lot better with structure um, and reassurance, especially first graders. If, you, if you've got it different in a, uh, if they were in like in a different room at kindergarten, and now they're with fifth graders, especially like a lot of, we do first through fifth grade. I know if we could, we would break it up first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, that's like that's the best way, I think, unless you can do each grade individually. Um, but you'd need massive, massive room for that. Um, but we got them all together, and our kindergartners who come in, that reassurance of what's going on until they get into a rhythm and a flow of things just really helps them out and kind of get engaged with what's going on. Um, after we do a welcome, we do something to engage the kids, some, so, some sort of... Uh, uh, it might be a sketch, it could be a quick game, it could be uh, a video, but something to re-engage their attention to the front because they've just sat down, they're probably playing video games or doing something. I mean, they got video games over here. They're all around, now we're asking them to sit down, quiet themselves, pay attention, and, and, and hear what we've got to say. And so you got you to bring, bring them in somehow. And uh, one of the ways that we do that is... We'll, I don't know if, if the sound is going to come through, but I'll show. We do something called Bible Story and Pictures, and it kind of teases the, uh, the Bible story that we're going to be talking about that day. Hi, my name's Stephen, and this is my brother Caleb, and we're here to tell you a story about a guy named Samson. Oh, oh, I know that guy. He's like super strong and fought like a bazillion dudes and had super long oh, hair. Uh, hey, 
just hold on, settle down, don't spoil the story. We're going to get to all that stuff. But let's start at the beginning, when Samson was just a baby. A super strong no, baby. just a regular baby. When Samson was born, an angel appeared to his parents and told them that God had a very special plan for Samson's life. Samson would be a hero. You see, at the time, his parents and all the other Israelites were being bullied by the Philistines. Oh, no, not Phil Osteen. I've heard of that guy. He's bad no, news. No, uh, it wasn't a guy named Phil. It was the Philistines. And they were some really bad dudes. God wanted Samson to take them out. So he grabbed no, his bazooka. No, he, <laughs> Caleb, he didn't have a bazooka. God gave him super strength to defeat the Philistines. Uh, what's going on here? He defeated them. Oh, Get boy. it? Okay. Um, so, it just goes on. And you might go, oh, you know, we can't do video like that. It's really easy. It's so, it's very, very simple. All of those are static drawings. Someone drew them, so you've got to find someone who can draw, and not fantastic like, you know, Leonardo-style drawing, just cartoon drawing. And then the background, you take two different pictures of paper, and you just, every other frame, go between those two pictures so it looks like something is happening. And then you have this, illusion of motion in the background when really it's just static pictures on top of this two frame going in the back and it makes it look a lot better than if you just put pictures up there or did a slideshow or something and it's that easy guys you could make this video in windows movie maker you can do it in uh if you have an apple i don't even, i forget what it's called iMovie or something whatever it is you can there's programs online it's so easy you just have to find someone who can draw Come up with a cool idea of a story that you want to tell. Add in a few jokes. They're kids again, like the bazooka, right? There's no bazookas in the Bible. But right there, you've got every single boy in your group who just engaged in what's going on on the screen because they're like, that's cool. That's funny. They can laugh at different things. The Bible can be fun. I'm going to listen to what these people say. And so that day we might, we'll be talking about Samson and going through the story, but um, you just you, you do it like that with a little video. This one's five minutes, and you've got their attention. You can go on to whatever's happening next. And what we usually do next after an engaging moment like that, or we might have another one, and I know this is like kind of a taboo subject almost, but puppets. And people are like, oh, no, puppets, they, they, you know, for whatever reason, puppets, people have gotten away from it. I love puppets. I think they're awesome. Puppet, again, like technology, is a tool. And the tool does not necessitate, like, how good or bad something is. It's the character that you've created that is going to be either awesome or terrible. And we created a character, $40 puppet on Amazon, $40, like, best $40 puppet in the entire world on Amazon of this orange orangutan. We've named him Bongo, and here's Bongo. Welcome back, tiny hairs, monkey fan lovers. I hope you're ready for, uh, for more adventure on the high seas today. If you recall, Captain Stinky Beard was searching for a map to the mysterious Almighty yesterday. And Maddie and Mabel said they had it. But when they brought it to him, it turned out to be the Bible. Captain Stinky Beard not seem too pleased to be receiving a book when he was expecting a map. You can probably see that a good sense of humor is important on the pirate ship. So, in order to prepare you for your day aboard the Hammerhead, I want to teach you the right way to tell a pirate joke. First, I shall tell you the joke the wrong way, and then I will tell you the same joke, but with the proper pirate flair. Here we go. Why can't you go to see the movies the pirates watch? Now you go ahead and say, I don't know why. I don't know say why. It. I don't know why. Because they're rated R. Now, that was a terrible joke. Yes. But I can improve on the punchline by saying it more like a pirate. I put my hand over my eye as if it were an eye patch, you see. And I say the R more like a pirate. Like this. R. Isn't it much, much funnier? Don't you think? Now let's try this joke again the funny way. Remember your line. After I asked the 
question. You have to say, I don't know. Why? All right? Here we go. Ahem. Why can't you go to see the movies? The pirates watch. Because they're rated. Because they're rated. Ah! 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 I have a hook in my eye. Good heavens, this is excruciating. Okay. Shiver me, shivers. So that's Bongo, and he just does something fun. And what we use Bongo for a lot is we'll do three-part sketches. We'll bring him out, and he'll introduce a problem that he's going through that we want the kids to have a solution for at the end. So by teaching Bongo, our puppet, we're actually teaching our students that are in the audience. And so that's a very, that's a classic way of using a character to get a, something across and teach kids without letting them know that they're really being taught because they love being smarter than um, a character who's really silly that's in the room. So they'll start shouting out the answers or saying, no, no, they're doing this, or, oh, you got to watch out for this. And we always play dumb, right? You just, that's what you do. And, um, and they get it and they learn it. And our students love Bongo. Like, it's crazy. Not only the students, but the adults love Bongo. If we bring Bongo out for uh, what we have is a, something called Kids on the Ridge Live, where we do our children's ministries for the whole church downstairs. We take a Sunday, and we let the parents see what their kids are learning every single Sunday. And we kind of give them a, a taste of that so the parents can go, hey, what you're learning is really cool. That's instead of, hey, I don't know what they're teaching up there or what they're doing. So do that. Bongo always shows up. And and people love them. That's not because it's a puppet and it's $40. It's because the character and the personality that we've given Bongo is just so it's just so adored that they, they really jump on that. So we'll start with something engaging um, like Bible Story and Pictures or with Bongo. And then we always uh, go into worship. And our worship is super, super simple. Uh, we, we do something um, where we fake fake it. We bought $200 guitars. We don't plug them in. We get two people on stage with bandanas and fun colors where our shirts are really bright for our children's ministries. They go up there and they strum those guitars like they're in a rock band and the kids do not know a difference. They go, those people are the best guitars in the entire world. There's drums going and all sorts of other instruments in the songs. Doesn't matter. You get people up there, don't plug them in. They don't have to know how to play a single thing. Just make sure they're having fun and smiling. And you've just elevated a worship thing to a really, actually a, a really high level, just in the sense of, because kids, they don't know the difference. They don't even understand plugged in versus not plugged in. If one kid, you know, brings up, hey, that guitar wasn't plugged in. Uh, yeah, it's a super guitar. It's wireless. It's not how good it is. I don't know. You know, or, or you can go, yeah, you're really smart. Don't tell anyone. I don't know. I don't know. But we play songs that are super simple and rememberable, but also teach a point. And uh, my favorite one is this one, which is called I Love My Bible. That's just the Old Testament part, but it goes to the New Testament as well. And 
with those songs, we've got dancers up there who might be singing the song, but they don't, they don't have mics or anything, and then we have the guitar players, and it just looks like a full stage with a full band, and you can get anyone just who has energy to do that. And we've, over the years, that's just what we've done, and we have the, a really great um, worship team now who does that, and the kids always get excited, and they get up, and when you see kids who want to get up and do the songs and, and worship God. It's just a really cool thing. And so um, we go into worship and we, 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 we tell them, hey, you know, this is a time where we're going to worship God, honor God, and, um, and they, they, they respond really well to that. But go into worship. And then we have something called the big answer, which I think is really important. Um, the big answer is the answer to the big question, what did you learn in church today? Because students, kids... They, there's a lot going on, and they sometimes have a really hard time remembering if when put on the spot, their parents will go, hey, what did you learn in church today? And sometimes they'll go, oh, I don't know, or I don't remember. It was five minutes ago, Mom. How do you expect me to remember five minutes ago? And so we came up with this, the big answer, which has this silly little bumper thing, and big answer which is the big answer to the big question. We make things that are repeatable and rememberable. So in our healing series, we did something called Big or Small, Jesus Heals It All. So Big or Small, Jesus Heals It All. And it's just that. It's one sentence, repeatable, rememberable. And sometimes coming up with the big answer can be really tricky because you don't you want it to be something that's that's catchy, that they can say again and again. For our fear series, we did... Um, fear is not the boss of me, and we did something all about that. And so, um, or our plants versus zombies, I call Jesus when I'm sad. Just something so that when they go, and if people are taking notes, they did this big study, which we don't have students take notes, they'll remember 80% of what you said by Tuesday. If they don't take notes, they'll remember 20% of what you said by Tuesday. It's very low. But... If nothing else, if you can get them to remember the big answer and that Jesus loves them more than anything in the entire universe, that's a win. That's a huge win. Because when something comes up, when they're at home at night and they're scared, the lights are off, they heard a noise in their closet, and they go, no, fear is not the boss of me. They remember that. They remember the stories that we've told. And they go, okay, no, God is with me. Fear is not the boss of me. They might not have any remembrance whatsoever of what my actual talk or message was about, but they remember fear is not the boss of me. And so that's just really huge. It's a big answer. Answer the big question. We do it every single time um, because it's so important. We want them to walk away with a truth, something that they can, that's usable for them in their week. So um, we go through, so we do the big answer, um, make it repeatable, rememberable. We know that parents are going to ask them, or even if their parents don't, we always say that they will, so they better be ready. And um, then uh, after the big answer, we'll transition to um, uh, part two of a sketch or something because they've just gotten this big answer, and so they've had to sit there and listen, and we make it fun. But before going in and then talking to them and making them sit down longer because their attention spans are only so much, we break it up. We try to have a lot of different segments in there so that they're never just sitting there for a long time and, and, um, and, and bored. So we'll break it up. We'll do like a part two of a sketch or something. We'll have a video come out or we'll play like a really quick um, minute to win it game or something that they're all on YouTube and you can download them for free and they're super easy. Like uh, I think one of our, our favorite ones is you get a ruler with Tic Tacs on both the ends and they have to like shake all the Tic Tacs out. Right, it takes a minute, super easy, and they they cost nothing, you know, whatever it is for a box of Tic Tacs. You bring two two kids up, and you do that quick, kind of get some of the energy out, some different stuff, and then we go into um, the talk, the message, and we try to make it 15 minutes or less, which can be difficult, but as a communicator, it's harder to speak less than it is to speak more. It really focuses you and focuses us and focuses me when I have to go, okay, I have what I want to talk about, and I have to make that 
fit within 15 minutes or less, it's really easy to talk a really long time and get all the ideas and everything in your head out there. But um, one thing that my team and I, and I've drilled into my team, is something's not done when there's nothing more you can put into it. Something is done when there's nothing else you can take out of it. When you're compromising the integrity of if it's a sketch, if it's a talk, if it's whatever, when there's nothing else you can take out of it, that's when it's done. Don't use seven words when four will do. It's that whole thing because uh, it, it, it's kids. They're the, you're speaking to your highest maturity level is the fifth grade girls, if it's, we're talking elementary, and they have up around a 15 to 17 minute attention span. Fifth grade boys, less. First grade boys, like seven minutes max, right? But you're speaking to, you always speak to the highest maturity level in the room, and then you make the other kids learn up. They're going to be there for a while, and so you just speak to the highest maturity level. But 15 minutes or less, and it's just going to make you, it just makes you a better communicator when you do that. After the talk, we do a small group. However, something, um, when I first came on staff, they were doing small groups, but it was not a small group that, um, that was working very well, so we actually stopped it because it was just a time filler. And so I do want to challenge you guys, if you guys are doing small group, to make sure small group time is really intentional. Not, hey, you know what, I've got this hour, I don't know what to put here, I got time I need to fill, so let me just dump all these kids on some leaders for some time and they can talk to them while you know, we get something else ready. No, if you're gonna do small group, make sure it's really intentional. Equip the leaders, equip the volunteers with everything that they need to succeed. Tell them the stuff beforehand. Everything that we do goes out on Wednesday before Sunday and we require them to read it, know it, so they're not coming in there and then they're in the back and trying to learn the lesson. Because we want to give our best product that we can to these kids because they're not there for us. We're there for them, right? We're, we don't require them to be there to pump us up and, oh, look at all these cool things that we can do on a Sunday. No, no, no. We're there for them. And so if we're not giving our absolute best, and I, there's a lot of places I know will say, well, it's kids, right? No. It, it's people that need to know Jesus. And God wouldn't have made the standard of faith that like a child if he didn't think children were going to be able to understand what it meant when Jesus went to the cross, died for them, loves them more than anything in the entire universe. So make that time really intentional because the relationships that the kids form with small group leaders is what's going to bring them back. The cool things that we do on stage are cool. They're gimmicks. They're stuff. It's the relationships that they form. It, they say within six months, if they don't make a friend, they are not going to come back. And if you don't get the kids, they're going to make it hell on earth for their parents if they don't want to go to church. And at some point, the parents are just going to give up and say, okay, we're going to try somewhere else. Get those kids in a small group. Make sure it's intentional. Our leaders write a note to every new kid who comes into their small group during the week, a letter saying thank you for coming with their name, something that they know that they learned about them. So then they get that in the mail and go, someone knew I was there. Someone cares about me. I didn't just fill a seat. I wasn't just there. And so make that time really intentional. And those small group leaders leverage them for those related. If, say if a kid, a student is uh, not making friends somewhere or doing something, get a small group leader in there because then that will translate over. And that's, they're just looking for somebody. Everyone wants to know that somebody knows who they are and that somebody cares. Everyone in the whole world know who they are and that somebody cares. And so small group can be a really powerful time for that. Small group can also be a complete waste of time if it's just that. Got 15 minutes here in my hour. I don't know what to do. Let's just do a small group and give them something to color. Not that coloring is bad by any means, but when it's that, when you go about it with that attitude, it is bad. Um, and then after small group time, we'll come back. We'll do something called the What Just Happens. So What Just Happens. And we don't do this one every time, but it's in there. Basically, we just have a bunch of different things that we look at a gathering. When we're building it out, we go, hey, what do we want to do for this week? And we plug those in for what's going to work best. And the question we always ask is, what's the best thing for our kids? So what just happened? We go over and reiterate what just happened in the small group, in the talk. Might go over the big answer again. And then we play a game, a big game. 
game that involves everyone in the whole audience. It's um, we'll either sometimes we'll bring kids on stage, but it will still engage all the kids that go on. One of our favorite games is uh, something called Wheel of Game Shows. Wheel of Game Shows, and we say things like, all right, so you're going to come up here and we have a button on stage that they can come and they press it. Now, again, it's an illusion of control. The button doesn't go anywhere. There's someone in the back who's, we, we know what games we're already going to play, right? We're not ever caught off guard. We might play that we are, whoa, oh, you got that one. Oh, it's so great. No, it, we, we know because we've got a plan. You've got to plan ahead. You've got to control what's going on. So we'll go and we'll do really fine things like, you could win a game, you could get a game like Burger King or Pogo Stick Donkey Kick involves real life donkeys and pogo sticks. Uh, Stink or Stank or Wet Nap Face Slap. Now, three of these games are not real. Stink or Stank is a real one, but the other three, you'll never get them. And then the last one we do is this is funny, and if you like him, I'm sorry, but it's fine. The Bieber. If you land on the Bieber, then not only do you lose all your turns, all your points, but you also owe us $50. So don't land on the Bieber, right? And so it just adds a little bit of, you know, something to the game, a little, like, they have a little bit of skin in the game. They're like, oh, no, don't land on the Bieber. Um, so then we'll go, the guy will say, spin that wheel. It'll go through the things on the screen, and then they'll hit the button, and then, oh, brownie points. Great. Well, uh, how we play brownie points is you have to get as many brownie points as you can in 30 seconds. All right. Are you ready? Yes. Perfect. We don't give them a chance to even s respond. That's the whole game of brownie points. We don't explain the rules. We don't explain how to get brownie points. We just go, and all of a sudden they have 30 seconds, and then a plate of brownies. They don't know what to do. Usually they always eat them. And we go, oh, you're supposed to stack the brownies, actually. You know, you're not supposed to eat them. And they, 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 Everyone just gets a kick out of it, you know, because they never know. Um, there's one called Walk in the Dark, which, again, uh, we put a blindfold on the kids. We bring them down to the front stage. I stand in the back with a gift card, like a $15 or $50 gift card, and I say, okay, if you can get to me, then you get the gift card. All right, go. So they'll go. I don't tell them that I'll move. And so as soon as they get close, you know, I'll move around. But we always, you know, we always give them a prize just for playing. Um, that's the other thing. Always reward people for coming up on stage or doing something because at some point if you play, like we like to play jokes on kids sometimes a little bit, and they, 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 they get it and they're like, okay, yeah, that's funny. But if you keep doing it, then at some point they're going to go, no, not worth it. I'm not going to win. You guys are just playing jokes, so it's, it's not worth it. But... Um, so we, we've got a bunch of different stuff. We play Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? We play um, Let's Make a Deal. That is a great one. They love that one. We'll have um, two boxes on either side of the stage, something in my pocket, and something under a chair. So there's six things. Just watch it on YouTube, how to play Let's Make a Deal. They'll go through it, and we'll give out six prizes that morning that are just really fun and simple. And a really great, honestly, a great tool. I know Minute to Win It is really good, but... Jimmy Fallon and his games that he plays are awesome. We'll play the whisper challenge where we put headphones on the kids and they got to talk and figure out what the other one is saying. They'll scream it because they don't know how loud they're being. Like, let other people do the really hard work for you. That's what we learned. Come up with these things. Then we get a YouTube downloader, grab the bumper that they use, and just rip it off. And kids, they don't care. It's just, But it's something to transition to the next thing because transitions are really important, but, and we just go, oh, that's super easy. Some are, okay, arguably really hard to do, and you'd have to take a lot of time, but some of them require nothing, or, oh, a great one, we play pie golf. So we got a plastic golf set and a, and a green, like, putting tee, and the kids have to putt the, the, the golf ball into the tee, and the first one to make it in pies the other one in the face with the whipped cream pie. They love it. It's like the best game. They're like, when are we playing pie golf again? But a game, again, is just something to, after they've sat down, they've heard your talk, they've been in small group, it's something to bring it back, make it fun, and then we always close with announcements, what's happening next, and inviting them to something. Always, always, always invite them to the next thing, especially if they're new. Because if you don't, they might miss out, they don't know, you never assume that they know what's happening next. And that's the fastest way to get them plugged into what's going on because you want them plugged in you want them connecting with other kids and so if there's um, 
uh, event that you're having or doing something, tell them about it. Say, hey, this is coming up. We want you to sign up. Here's how. We're going to give you something when you walk out for you and your parents or tell them go online, get in. And, and if you're new, and a lot of times it, it doesn't work for everyone um, if it's a lot of money, but we'll say if you're new, we want you to go so bad that we'll cover the cost for you. Like, we'll, we'll cover it. We want you to be there. We want you to make friends. And so always leave them um, telling them uh, about something that's happening next. And always leave them wanting something more. So our character, we might have a three-part sketch come out, and it will allude to something happening the next week. And they'll be like, oh, what? What's happening? What's going on? And so by doing that, you're buying a lot of, you know, them coming back. So, But that's basically, that's basically it. We start with the welcome. Something to engage them, worship, big answer, sketch part two or a transition piece, talk, small group, game, closing sketch or bit, announcements, inviting them to something. That's, that's our basic structure pretty much every single time. Some segments might move around a little bit, but that's basically it. Um, also with this stuff, uh, my email is Stephen my name with a ph at churchontheridge.org and if you want anything that we have i'll send it to you for free like you can just you can just have it like anything if you want any of the stuff just email me and i will i will email it to you and make sure you have it because we're all working for the kingdom together and i want to give it out to you guys so uh any questions anything i when is this did i go over time no we got yeah, oh, perfect. Right, 15 minutes, that's what they wanted us to have. So you guys are free to go if you want, or we can talk and ask questions. Um, what works for you guys? You can talk about that. So do you use any kind of a curriculum, or do you just set up your own lessons? Okay, we're going to cover this. And it's a good question. So we found with a curriculum, with going for elementary in particular, using a curriculum built by other people, is really hard because they didn't build it for your kids. You know your kids best. It's really difficult. But what you can do is take elements of it and say, okay, so they're doing a lesson on fear. I'm going to do my own lesson on fear, but I'm going to take their graphic. I like their graphic. We did one for Halloween, and one of the talks was uh, uh, vampires, how to love people who suck the life out of you. Right? Well, Stephen Furtick had done something similar, and it was like how to hug a vampire. So we just took that, because they big mega church that's got plenty of people on staff that are getting paid to make this stuff. I'm, like, I don't, I'm not going to take my time. They got a great graphic, and I might change it a bit so that it works for us. As far as talks go, no. I never use a talk that someone else has written unless it's fantastic and it's immediately applicable to my kids. That's just, it's not lazy, but it's, it's not doing the best thing for your kids because they, they, deserve, they deserve your best. And it's not like all of our time should go to preparing a talk. I don't believe that either. We're leaders. We've got people who are looking to us, people that we're building up, volunteers, doing different things. But they, they do deserve our best. And if, you're, if, we're, if I was to just take, I feel like I, if I was to take someone else's talk, I wouldn't look at it until five minutes before on Saturday because I didn't have to put any time into writing it and then I'd just go up there and read it. Or I would wing it to the sense of, oh, I'm good enough on stage to where I can just read along and kind of know what's going on and then, you know, build it up and do their stuff. And so it's, it's just not, it's not, it's not the best thing, I think. Yeah. If you can write it yourself, do it. Or see what someone else wrote, use pieces of it, maybe... You don't have to look up Bible verses then because they, they have ones for you, but, you know, as much as you can, I'd say write it. Yeah? Uh, just to add to that first before I ask my question, I know for us, uh, so I'm at West Sunday in Tacoma. Nice. Um, and we try very hard to connect the uh, service that the parents are doing yeah. to the kids. That way they can have a conversation at home. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah, when they talk about sex, it gets really awkward. Yeah. Yeah. Song of Solomon, get out of Song of Solomon. But, no, for, like, your games and stuff, a lot of elements, right? Like, you go from video to, or game or video to talk to, to
building those or doing them? No, no, just actually doing them. Mm, a good bit for a game is six minutes or less. If you can do the game in six minutes or less, then that's, that's pretty good. And that's, again, you being really clear on what you're communicating, how the game works, what's going on. So you've got to know the game really well. Again, if you're going up there and just, oh, yeah, well, we think it plays this way, or you don't have something ready, like you don't have people who are bringing this stuff out, that's, that's where that time goes. The time to play a game and explain a game, you can do in six minutes or less. When it starts getting eight, 10, 12 minutes to play this game, it's because someone wasn't ready, the pieces weren't ready, something didn't work, it's the, it's the dead time. And one of the ways that we really try to be excellent at um, where I work for our, our kids is get rid of as much dead time as we can. We don't, we don't like the dead time. We only get them for an hour a week. And so we want to plug that as much time into them as we can. So, But we do a lot of, yeah, it's a lot of video pieces, a lot of transitions, because, again, when you get to it and you think about it, the greatest communicators, the greatest uh, late-night talk show hosts and stuff, the way they transition pieces is what, how they rise and fall. They can have really great pieces, but if it's really static, you can tell. And so those transition pieces are what rise and, like, make the stuff really good. So we've just done it with video because it's the easiest for us to transition things. So that's why we have a lot of bumpers, a lot of bumper videos to bring in this new piece. We've got a lot of, you know, it's just, and it's visual, it's loud, it's stuff on the screens. And so kids are like, oh, okay, this is the next thing. Yeah. So six minutes or less for a game. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we have volunteers who are sitting in the crowd with the students. And again, if you go over the rules at the beginning and go over those expectations, they, some, most kids will do pretty good. But we'll have people sitting in the crowd, probably two or three. And we'll have uh, 70 kids in a room uh, probably at once for our elementary. Um, but I've... I've done it for 5,000, and it's the same principle. At Church on the Move, there was an exorbitant amount of kids. It was ridiculous. Um, and then we'll have at least two people on the dance team, the guitar players, if we've got them, a host, the speaker, the sound guy, and maybe another host or but we'll, we'll, we'll leverage people with multiple roles. So like the dance team might do the dancing. We might bring out props for the games or different pieces, and then they'll go and sit with the kids as well. So those two are doing a lot of stuff. We don't just let them come in and do one thing and then, hey, all right, I'm out of here. No, 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 no. You're here for the hour, really hour and a half, 15 minutes before, 15 minutes after. Um, and you're a volunteer. You're helping. You're making this happen. Without them, we can't do what we're, what we're doing. But we'll use them in lots of different ways. But it does. There's a lot of people moving around on stage. Um, it's not a good day. I haven't done my job if I'm the only one on stage. If I'm doing each piece and I'm having to run the show, I didn't do my job that week. Yeah. Even if I think oh, I'm so awesome, I didn't do my job because that's not my job. Uh, the dancing, do you involve the kids in that? Or is it mainly just your adult leaders? Well... At the beginning, I didn't because I wanted to keep it really high level. At some point, we couldn't stop some of the kids who were just so into it. So now we let them come up, and honestly, it's been a good thing. At, like at Church in the Move, never in a million years would they ever have allowed that to happen, um, which is not a problem, not a problem at all. But being 70 kids in a room, it's smaller, and honestly, the kids that come on stage do a great job. They're just high energy that it's fine it's fine you you have to ask yourself for each of your bits where that excellence line is and if it's if it's something where it starts to take away from the excellence that i'm always always watching that if it takes away from the excellence of putting our best foot forward and giving our best to the kids then we'll address it and go hey you know what uh let's not bring these kids up to do you know, let's bring kids up. Let's tell them about the sketch we want them to do beforehand. Let's not just pull up three random kids from the crowd and have one of them sitting there picking their nose and going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I'm Lazarus. Sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm out. And it's like, okay, all right. Yeah, ha, ha, but they missed it because that took away from what we're trying to teach. Yeah. Um, I was curious what your guys' like, creative process was like, leading up to um, 
intense. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot. So we'll start on Monday, and we'll go in there and we'll go, okay, so what we'll have... We'll have our series done. We should have our, like our idea for the series done. We'll have series planning meetings ahead, a whole series ahead, so we're not like trying to plan a series for that Sunday or Saturday and a, then and a gathering. Um, so we should have our idea of what we want the series to be, what we want to, what we want the, them to walk away with with that series. Then we'll go. Okay, who do we have? Who do we have this weekend? So we'll look at our personnel. Who do we have? Okay, we've got Kevin. We've got because some people are better at hosting and doing different things than others. So we look at who we have, and then from that, we'll take those 10 elements that I talked about, the welcome, the different things, and we'll break them down into those pieces. So say we don't have someone who can do a sketch or play a character, or um, Bongo is a puppet, so if we don't have the voice of Bongo, we call him Bongo's agent, but because the kids don't know. They've never met him. We've never showed who plays Bongo. That's really important, by the way. It's like Disney stuff. Um, uh, we won't do one. We're not gonna. We're not gonna shoehorn something in for the sake of doing it. Even if in our series we said, "Hey, you know what? Sketch is gonna work really great here. It's the first week. Let's start with a sketch. It's gonna be loud. It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna have these pieces." And then someone gets sick. We're not gonna just rewrite the thing to try and make it work for someone else. No, we're gonna do something different. We'll go back to the drawing board. We'll figure something else out, dude. And. We have enough elements now and enough people who know how to do all the elements, so it's a lot easier. When we first got started, it was really hard because you got to get people up there. you got to teach them how to do all the things. you got to train them. So we just brought them in on the weekend and said, hey, if you want to be a host, and we tell them that, just like Jimmy Fallon is a host, if you want to be a host, it's a big deal. It's a high role. It's a big role. You are responsible for moving the gathering along and getting us to the talk and focusing everything. And we'd love to have you. And we got people who came in and wanted to do it. And now they're, they're, it's fantastic. It's easy. But everything, there's a learning curve and it takes time. And so we'll start on Monday. And on Monday, we'll look at who we have. And then we'll start putting those elements on the board, what we want to do. Then on Tuesday, we'll divvy out those elements to different people and say, OK, you're responsible for writing the sketch. You're responsible for getting this lighting thing done, if, it, if that's that. So we'll go through that. Wednesday, we'll go back, we'll look at what was written because, you know, we want them to get it done pretty quick. We'll make notes, et cetera. We'll, we'll talk about the talk. We'll go over the object lesson that day on Wednesday. If we need to build anything, buy anything, get anything, divvy that out. And then on Thursday, we should have all the pieces. We'll do final read-throughs and um, just make sure that we're ready to go for our Saturday because we take Fridays off. And then Saturdays, most of the day, we have church at 6.30, and then we'll, we'll go. So everything starts on Monday, and the first thing we look at is what's our series about and who do we have? And then we build everything else on top of that. Yeah. And we are building something right now called the 18-year plan, which is going to be hopefully really cool, but it's kind of crazy. Um, our goal is at any age, any level of a student walking into our building, we will know what we want them to learn by the end of the year and what stories and stuff we're going to teach them for that year to make sure that they know it and learn that. And then those things are going to build upon each other for a final, by the time that they're 18, if they go through this entire program with us by the time they're 18, we are sure that they have a firm foundation of Jesus, know who he is, Christ follower, fully devoted follower of Christ, the whole thing. Um, and so we, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do, we'll, that's, that's what we're trying to build right now. Yeah. So um, is your role specific each week or, I mean, are you kind of? I'm the pastor, so no. <laughs> Yeah, no one, no one changes. It's the same gathering on Saturday as it is on Sunday, and it's the same gathering at 9.30 as it is at 11. And when we had more, it's the same one every single time. It's imp I don't know how anyone could train multiple teams to do the same thing. That would be, that'd be a logistical nightmare. So if our volunteers who are sitting in the crowd, they can change. Our dance team can change because they're doing, it's the same, that thing is the same every time. Our host doesn't change. They got to be there all weekend. The talk doesn't change. Got to be there all weekend. The character doesn't change. Got to be there all weekend. 
So those pieces, we, we never, ever, ever, or I won't do a talk on Saturday and then host on Sunday. Nope. Uh-uh. I won't do that either. Yep. How many experiences do you guys have? We have three right now. We had four all on Sunday, but we switched to two on Sunday and one on Saturday, and it's been awesome. So um, just by doing that, the church itself has grown, uh, what is 180 people in six weeks or something, just by changing the times and adding a Saturday gathering? Yeah. Yeah, less, less <laughs> gatherings, making it better times, 180 people. And 50 of those are elementary kids. No, they're there every week, but they host once a month. Yep. So, and so they'll be on all three gatherings once a month, but they'll be there every week or every other week. My challenge is that I have, we have five services on the weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, one Saturday, four on Sunday. Yeah, it's a lot, man. Sure. People respond to vision, not to need. So if you tell them why, the why behind it, and how it's going to build the ministry and why it's such a good thing, they'll respond to that. You'll get some people, and you just got to guard, you know, guard them. You know, uh, It's always hard in the beginning, but people get it. And if you get one, use that person to get more because they can talk about what a great experience it is. And I don't know what the relationship is. Uh, it is between your senior pastor and the children's ministries at your church. But if you can, use the power of the pulpit. Just bug him or her or whoever it is over and over and over again until they finally are so sick of you that they are going to go up there and go, all right, we need some hosts for our children's ministry area. I can't get the children's pastor off my back. We need some people. It's going to be all five services on the weekend. But you know what? I know you can do it. Let me see some hands right now of who can do this for me. Boom, they'll do it. Again, that's more of a need. Then when they get to you, you've got to do the vision and get that like going really, really quickly because after about 10 weeks of people falling on a sword, they'll go. Yeah, we do a one-month um, like evaluation period for our volunteers. We say, if you don't like it in the month, no hard feelings. We'll find somewhere else for you to serve. If you get through that month, we do a six-month minimum because we can't, um, we, can't, uh, we can't have someone call in all of a sudden and say, hey, I'm done. It's Friday. I'm not going to be there. So we do that six-month commitment. We make it really clear, hey, you're committing for at least six months because we need to be able to be sure that when we schedule you, you're going to be available and be there and but that one month thing is very important and by giving them the out by saying hey again one month no hard feelings it takes a lot of pressure off people because again say they do it and they do it for a month but they hate it you don't have a volunteer in there that you want you have someone who is going to be a disease and it's not good it's not about do you have blood in your veins and putting people in spots is getting the right people in the right spots to be able to go up because at some point that ship is going to sink if you just have bodies. If you're just filling holes with bodies, it's it's not going to be good. seems like the answer at the time because you're just trying to stay above water, but there will come a point where you're pulling your hair out because it's just awful. All right, it's, uh, it's 11 or 1059. Um, Pastor Don, I believe, is going to be speaking to us upstairs. So thanks, everyone, for coming. And again, um, if you want anything, there's I have... so way more games too and different stuff or curriculum things. I can send you all the stuff we've done. Um, Just email me and I'd be happy to do that.